Welcome, everybody. Um, today, I'm very excited to welcome our English horn uh, player and then also semi-acting principal O over a couple concerts this year, uh, Jennifer Kirby. Um, I should say Dr. Jennifer Kirby. I try to use that as much as I possibly can. Um, what's great about Jenny is she is also an early music specialist. So uh, today, she's going to be sharing a lot of early oboes and um, other members of the oboe family that we don't often see in the orchestra. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to Jenny, and she's going to talk a little bit about herself, and then we'll get started with learning about the English horn and the oboe family. Take it away, Jenny. Great. Thanks, Sammy. I'm so excited to be here with you all today, and I'm really excited to hopefully see some of you in our May concert. It'll be so great to be back in Tilson and have a little bit more of in-person contact. So as Sammy said, um, my name is Jenny Kirby. I am from a small town near Kansas City, Missouri, and I did my undergraduate degree there at Northwest Missouri State University. And then I came over to Indiana University where I did my master's and my doctorate. So my doctorate is in oboe, but I do have minors in historical instruments, so historical oboes. And I also minor in music history, and I specialize in Baroque music and ancient music. So there's a little bit of difference between those two, but they're, they're both passions of mine. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started sharing my screen here. And can everybody see that okay? Great. So I just wanted to talk about um, the mechanics of the oboe a little bit. I know that Rebecca talked about some of these things, but it's been a little bit, so I thought I'd give a refresher. Oboes are conical bore instruments, so a lot of the brass players also mention the difference between the conical and the cylindrical bore instruments. Um, so oboes are a conical bore instrument. Um, the bore is a rigid structure. So if you think about if you pluck a string, the string vibrates and you get um, you get a sound and it continues to vibrate. But on the oboe, when you play the sound, um, it's not vibrating. The bore of the instrument isn't vibrating. So you don't have any of those sort of sympathetic beautiful tapery vibration. So when a player plays the note and blows air through the instrument, the pitch starts. And when the player stops, the pitch stops. So a lot of times you'll hear, um, you know, nice, beautiful tapers from oboists. And we work really, really long and really, really hard to make those happen. So I know that Rebecca did mention this, but very little air actually passes through the instrument because of the size of the reed. So instead of where you think of having a tuba where you're just blowing massive quantities of air through a large instrument, the oboe you're actually using pressure to create um, a, the sound. So it's um, more pressure and less air. So I found some numbers here um, about the breath pressure and the oboe ranges from 25 um, milligrams of mercury to over 90 milligrams of mercury. And so for comparison to Sammy's instrument, the clarinet, it ranges from 15 to 45. So it takes a lot more pressure to get the note started and then also to continue to play the instrument. So I just wanted to talk a little bit first about the modern instruments of the oboe family. So the ones that you would actually see in the orchestra. So uh, first we have the oboe, and that's our soprano member of the family. It has a practical range of low B flat up to high A, and then it has an extended range up to high C, but that's usually reserved for modern solo type pieces because they're very difficult notes to get out. Then we move on to the alto member of the family, and that's the oboe d'amore, which translates to the oboe of love. And so you'll notice here that it's a little bit bigger. It's lower. It's in the key of A, so that's a minor third below the oboe. And so you see similarly the range is about the same, just a little bit lower. You'll also notice here that we have a different type of bell. So this is a bold bell. 
And as I talk about the early instruments, I'll talk about the evolution of this bold bell. You'll also notice up here at the top where the reed comes out, you might not be able to see, but there's a piece of metal. And I've got one here from my English horn. And this is called a bocal. And so this just connects the reed to the instrument, um, allowing for a little bit extra space. And so you'll also hear a lot about the vocals when um, Sarah does her talk on the bassoon. But it starts with the oboe de more, and then we go up to the tenor of the family, and that's the English horn. So that's what I play for the Terre Haute Symphony Orchestra. It is in the key of F. So that is just like the French horn it is in the key of F. So it's a fifth lower. It does, um, it goes down to what is fingered as a low B or a low E. And then there is an extension that you can add to the English horn to make it go down to low B flat. Then we have two really cool instruments and they're both considered bass oboes. So a lot of times composers at the turn of the 20th century, they were writing for what they called bass oboe. And it kind of meant either of these two instruments. So either the baritone oboe, which we have here, that looks just again like, like they keep stretching it out. <laughs> so they take the oboe and they just keep making it bigger. And so that is an octave below the regular oboe. And then we also have another bass oboe, and that is the hecophone. And the hecophone is a really unique instrument. It was made by a bassoon maker, Heckel, which I'm sure Sarah will talk about because he was very influential in the bassoon. Um, there's only about 100 of them in existence, and they're not made anymore, so they're very rare instruments these days. Um, so some pieces that you can hear these instruments, the hecophone, is written a lot for by Richard Strauss. So um, Salome, Electra, Alpine Symphony all call for hecophone. And then the bass oboe or the baritone oboe is most commonly heard in Holtz planets. So there's a big solo at the beginning of Mercury. Sometimes if you can't get a hold of a bass oboe, it's played on bassoon, <laughs> but it's originally written for bass oboe. So those are the members of the modern oboe family. So I wanted to talk about a little bit about reeds because that's one of the most common questions I get, not only um, from lectures like this, but from other musicians. How do you make a reed? So I have a picture here of the reed plant. It's called Arundo Donax or the giant reed. It, you can find it in the United States. It's actually an invasive species. Um, and oddly enough, um, there's some on my property, <laughs> uh, but it would not be good for making oboe reeds. So um, they grow the cane and it's used for all of the reed type instruments. So from double reeds to single reeds, they're using different sizes. So once we get the tubes, um, they go through a special drying process, they're cured, and then they come to us. And then we do a really important process called gouging. And so here's a picture of my gouging machine. And so you can see here, it's got a bed where the cane goes, and then it's got a blade here. And I've got two pieces of cane here. So this first one is from the tube. So I've cut that from the tube. You can see it's pretty thick. And what I'm doing when I'm gouging is I'm making it nice and thin to a very specific measurement. So from there, you take your piece of cane, you fold it over in half like I've done here. We have these things called shaper tips and they're like molds. So that way I have one for each of my instruments. So I know exactly the shape that the reed needs to be. And then you tie it on the tube and then it looks like a reed. Um, so I've got a picture there of an oboe reed and an English horn reed. So you can see the English horn reed is bigger. It's lower in pitch. Um, but the reeds have a lot of definition. So they have a definite style. And that's kind of unique to each player. And it's very unique between American playing and European style. So here is a graphic of all of my reeds that I have for you today. Um, so I've got two types of oboe reeds here. I've got my modern oboe reed, 
We've got my Baroque oboe reed that I'll play for you. I've got the two types of oboe de more reeds. So we've got the modern reed on the left, the early reed on the right. Then I've got my two types of English horn reeds. So I've got my modern English horn reed and I have my early English horn reed. So here I've split them out for you. And you'll notice that as you get lower in pitch, obviously the reeds become bigger. So you'll see, especially with the modern, that they're getting bigger and they're getting longer as you go from oboe to demore to English horn. But if you look at the Baroque side too, over time, our reeds have gotten a lot smaller. So the Baroque oboe reed that I have there is very large compared to the modern oboe reed. And that's just because of the nature of the way the instrument is and the amount of resistance that the instrument has and also how it's used. You need a really, um, a lot of resistance in order to play really loud for those big Mahler Shostakovich symphonies. But for the Baroque era, it's mostly little, little tiny ensembles. So they didn't really need to play that loud. Um, you'll notice here that all of these reeds are tied to a tube or what we call a staple, except this Baroque English horn reed. And it looks like a bassoon reed. It's so neat. Um, so I know that Sarah will talk a little bit more about bassoon reeds in her talk, but the earliest versions of the English horn reeds were actually um, what we have as bassoon reeds today. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the start of the oboe, just to uh, refresh from what Rebecca talked about. So um, at the beginning of the 17th century, there is a shift from unified sounds to individual artistry. So before the 17th century, we had things like Sean bands and recorder consorts, and everything was one unified sound or one unified family of instruments. And so around this time, they're starting to invent opera. So the vocalists have these beautiful, lavish, lines and the instrumentalists say, I want to play like that too. So they needed to create a new instrument to be able to do that. So they created what we know as the oboe. Um, its, first its first recorded use was in Jean-Baptiste Lully's ballet in 1657. So um, it was invented by a uh, maker called Otter. And what's really interesting is that when he made the instrument, he really made it right the first time. So from its start, it really remains unchanged until 1730. And even though it originated in France, as it travels throughout Europe, everybody is using the exact same model pretty much. So it's really interesting because a lot of other instruments sort of go through a an intermediary phase where they tweak it a lot, but the oboe just kind of popped out and there it was. So a little bit about the court of Louis the 14th, which was really influential, um, especially because Louis was stationed there. And so the court of Louis the 14th was the height of music in Europe. He was the cool guy who had all the best musicians. Everyone wanted to be like him. He had a group of musicians called La Musique de la Grande et Curie, which was 38 of the best players in all of Europe. And among those were 12 oboists who would play for the military, musical background, entertainment, and a variety of court activities. One of my favorite accounts is that um, King Louis XIV would walk through his garden and he would have a little oboe band follow him to create his own little soundtrack as he walked through his garden. Uh, his oboe bands were so popular that they really quickly spread throughout Europe. And we have accounts um, in 1690 of King George I of England creating his own royal chamber band of oboists. There's over 500 pieces for oboe band that survive around this period. And that's a lot and not all of the music was written down. So there's even more. So it's really interesting that 
the oboe was so popular and they had just these groups of oboes that would go around and play. So this is commonly known as the golden age of the oboe. And when the oboe was invented, it really quickly spread throughout Europe. And it became one of the most popular instruments of the 18th century. And I have a quote here from John Bannister um, in his Sprightly Companion. He's English, and this was in 1695. So only a few decades after the oboe was invented. One would wonder the French oat boy should obtain so great an esteem in all the courts of Christendom as to have preference to any other single instrument. So quickly, everybody was catching on to the oboe. And a majority of our repertoire does come from this time period, not only solo instruments, um, but also small chamber groups. If you think of Bach cantatas, tons of them have all the different kinds of oboe, and I'll play some of them for you as well. So now I'm going to talk specifically about the oboe of this time period. So I've got my Baroque oboe here. Um, so the Baroque oboe most notably is lower in pitch than the modern instrument. So in the United States here, we usually play at A equals 440 hertz, so commonly just called A440. Um, but in modern Baroque orchestras, we usually play at A equals 415, and that's a half step lower. So if I were to take this oboe into a modern orchestra and I were to play you know, my A to tune the orchestra, it actually comes out as a G sharp. Um, and that's just due to um, kind of a consensus of the pitches that were used in the time period. So the instrument has two keys, and we have them here, and they're referred to as the great key that looks like a swallowtail, and then we've got the small key. Um, it's played using cross fingerings. And so if you've ever played a recorder type instrument, this is similar and I'm going to stop sharing for a second so you can see here. So if I were to play the note B, that's just one finger. And then if I were to play the note A, that's my second finger. So what about B flat? So in order to play B flat, I have to pick up this finger and I skip a hole and I put down my third finger and that creates B flat and that's what's called cross fingerings because we're skipping a hole. And this creates a really unique sound in the instrument. And um, it kind of creates a muffled sound so a lot of times the oboe sounds different in different keys so it'll sound differently in C major as opposed to D minor. And that was really a um, that was really popular in the Baroque era to, that different keys had different meanings and what they called different affects. So they would move you differently. Um, because of those cross fingerings, it is limited to only about three sharps or three flats. So you can't play a ton of accidentals because the fingerings get pretty squirrely pretty fast. So um, this instrument requires less breath pressure than the modern instrument. The bore is a little bit bigger. And because of those cross fingerings, the reeds are lighter. And so that gives it a generally softer and more mellow sound than our modern instrument. I have listed there the range of the Baroque oboe. So the lowest note is C. And interestingly enough, there is no C sharp. So it skips from C to D and then it can go all the way up to the D above that. So I have some examples here of oboes that exist that are in museums in the Met Museum as well as the Brussels Conservatory Museum. So the first one here on the left, that is the very first oboe. So that is um, an oboe made by Autotere in the late 17th century, so the French maker. And then you'll see next to it, we have a dinner oboe, which is a German oboe. But you'll notice they look almost exactly the same. So again, Otetere really got it right. And my instrument is a copy of Eichentopf, which we'll talk about him and his name will keep popping up. 
And it's believed that these were the instruments that were played in box orchestra. So mine is a copy of a German instrument. I've also got a couple of really neat oboes there. One is made completely of ivory. It probably did not sound very pretty. It was probably more of um, a wealthy amateur type instrument to have. And then the other instrument there is made of a grenadilla wood, which is what my instrument is made of. And that's what our modern instruments are made out of. But this wood would have been really rare in at the time period because it's a really hard wood. And if you think about that they don't have the modern machinery that we have, so they're using like foot pedals and bows to turn the wood. So most early oboes are made out of much softer woods. So that instrument on the right would have been a, also a very expensive instrument being made out of a rare wood and then it has ivory inlay. So I'm going to play for you a little bit of French music. So I mentioned that the oboe was originated in France and then it quickly spread throughout Europe. Well, not only did the oboe spread, but French music spread. They really loved the music that Louis XIV was creating. And so a lot of composers wrote in the French style around this time period and were influenced by this specifically French style of music. So I'm going to play for you a piece by a woman composer of the Baroque. This is Elizabeth Jacquette de la Guerre, and this is from her six violin sonatas. And you might say, Jenny, this isn't a violin lecture. Well, a lot of times in the Baroque, um, pieces were attributed to certain instruments. They might say violin, they might say oboe, they might say treble instrument. And a lot of times it worked well on other instruments. So it was very common for instrumentalists to share and say, hey, this works well on oboe, and this piece does. So I'm going to play it on oboe. Um, so something to note about when I play this piece of French music, um, if you're used to the music of Bach, it's gonna sound very different. It has lots of ornamentation, little trills and little filigree, and lots of little small gestures that kind of make up the music. I'm also going to use a technique that's not used in the modern instrument anymore, and we'll see if you can pick up on it. Elizabeth Jacquette de la Guerre. So the interesting thing that I did was actually vibrato. So we think of vibrato as a mid 20th century technique that's used pretty much continuously now in modern music. But in the French Baroque, it was actually used as an ornament. And unlike today where vibrato is made with your air for wind instruments, it was actually made by licking your fingers. So I did play one note to get that vibrato-like sound that was used as an ornament. So now I'm going to move on and we're going to go to German music because what would the Baroque oboe be without some Johann Sebastian Bach? So this is an excerpt from a cantata, BWV 22, written in 1723. And like I mentioned, uh, my oboe is actually a copy of what was believed to be used in Bach's orchestra. And this is um, an aria that's for alto and oboe obligato, and I've included the, the text there um, for you. So the oboe is used in so many cantatas, and it was really hard to pick one to play for you today. 
And in fact, I know that Rebecca played the Ikaba Ganuk, number 82, which is one of my favorite pieces. Um, but today I've picked number 22 for you. So again, that was Bach Cantata number 22. Um, I actually recently played it with the Bloomington Bach Cantata Project, which is a project that produces about four to five cantatas a year. Um, and I'll go ahead and send the link that it's on YouTube. I'll send the link to Sammy to send out and the other movements have lots of oboe as well. And you can hear the whole orchestra with that, which is really, it's a really beautiful cantata. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to our alto member of the family. So we have the oboe of love, the oboe d'amore. It is in the key of A, so it is a minor third lower, and so it's considered the alto member of the family. Originally, there was an amore version of almost every instrument. There's viola d'amore, flute d'amore, so many. But the oboe is the only one that's still used today. It was invented in Leipzig around the time that Bach was positioned there, and it was used almost exclusively in Germany. So we have lots of, again, Bach cantatas and pieces by Bach. There's even a couple of oboe d'amore concertos by Bach that exist. Um, and there's lots of music by Telemann also that uses Oba de More. So it was first actually used by Telemann in 1722. It's known for its bold bell, and the bold bell was really common on the wind instruments de More. And so here's my de More here, and here's the cute little bulb at the end. And this in German was called the Leibesfuss, which means love foot. I just love that fact. Um, and so the bold bell actually not only helps with the construction of the instrument because it's really difficult to turn a piece of wood that flares out, but it also gives it this really beautiful mellow sound. And I really love the oboe de more. It's a really beautiful instrument. Um, so it was used a lot in Germany during the Baroque period, and then it kind of disappeared until we get to the 20th century when we have the revival of Bach and people said, oh, what's this instrument? <laughs> and so they recreated it. And you will most commonly hear it in Ravel's Bolero. So Ravel's Bolero has a big oboe de more solo. And um, I believe we might have played it. Do we play it with Daryl recently, Sammy? Yeah. Um, so that's with oboe de more. It's also used by um, composers like Benjamin Britten and Ligeti. Um, so um, I think um, a few other modern composers really like it. So it's kind of made a resurgence, so to speak. So like I said, the oboe de more is mostly a German instrument. So our friend Eichentopf here, um, as we mentioned, was probably played in Bach's orchestra. Mine is a copy of a German maker called Porschmann who was also around um, at box time and believed that maybe some of the instrumentalists used this oboe instead of the icon top. And then we have another example of an oboe de more, again, a German one from the mid 18th century. So I'm gonna play for you some Bach. <laughs> so this is an excerpt from Bach's Magnificat. Um, this is Quia Respices Humilitatum, um, and this is for an aria for soprano and oboe d'amore, 
I've played it a lot. Um, lots of sopranos really love this piece. It's a really beautiful piece. Um, and so when I play the Demore, I really notice how mellow and um, dark the tone is. So that is the Obo de More. Go ahead and put that away. So now we're going to move on to the tenor oboes. So uh, one that we have is called the Tai de Obois, and it's a tenor oboe keyed in the pitch of F, and it is the earliest of the tenor oboes. Um, it was likely created right alongside when the um, oboe was created and it was used in oboe bands. So usually an oboe band had oboes one, two, tied to oboe, and then what they called boss oboe, which was usually actually bassoon. It was first used in a Henry Purcell opera, the Diocletian in 1690, and it was called the tenor oat boy. It's a straight instrument with a bulbed or a flared bell. And it's used most commonly as um, an ensemble instrument. So um, to fill in kind of those tenor parts in the lines rather than being used as a solo instrument. Bach does mention that his orchestra did have ties and in a lot of his cantatas, he makes reference to uh, tie de Aubois but it's unknown if it was actually this instrument or if he was referring to a different instrument. And um, he uses the tie when it is those internal voices. So if it's doubling, say, the tenors in a chorale, he'll say that it should be tie. Whereas if it's a solo instrument, it would be a different instrument, which I'll talk about in a second. The tie de Aubois did completely disappear in 1780. So here are some examples of the tie. So we've got um, an example here. First, a German instrument with a bold bell. In the middle here, we've got a flared bell version. And then we've got this um, other really unique looking version um, where instead of having the wood filigree, it has uh, the metal accoutrements. So I will say something about the tie is that I have played it before. It is very difficult to play because it's so large and because the instrument is straight, the finger reach is very wide. So that led them to kind of say, how can we make this easier if we want to feature it as a solo instrument? And that's where one of my favorite instruments comes into play, the oboe da caccia. And the oboe da caccia is so cool. So here is the oboe da caccia. So it is a curved instrument made of a single piece of wood. And the curvature is believed to, um, you know, help with that finger reach. So it's much easier to play than a straight instrument. The oboe da caccia, um, the name means oboe of the hunt. And it was also sometimes called the oboe Bois de Silve or uh, the forest oboe. It's believed to have been invented by our friend Eichentopf in around 1722, and it was only played until about 1760 and mainly in Germany. It was first used by Bach in his cantatas, and in 1723 he wrote four cantatas for the instrument, so he really liked it. And it's believed, whereas the tie might have looked like an English horn to you. It's believed that this is actually the more direct predecessor of the English horn. And as we talk about the early English horns, you'll, you'll see why. Um, the curve again is 
most likely due to um, allowing ease of playing, but also because this instrument was then later used for military and cavalry music. So it would be um, akin to the hunting horn where you could have it on horseback. Um, like I said, it's made of a single piece of wood and then it is actually covered in leather. And it always has a flared bell, but the bell can be made of wood or metal. So here are some examples that exist of the oboe de kacha. So again, these are both German instruments. Um, we have one that looks a lot like mine that has a wooden bell. And then we have a version of the icon top. And those are the ones that if you watch, um, say some YouTube videos of a lot of modern Bach performances, you'll actually see the ones with the metal bell. Um, the metal bell creates a really loud, really kind of brassy sound. And usually you have to play it in a way that kind of mutes the sound like you would mute a horn with your hand just because it, it comes out so loud. <laughs> so um, my instrument is a copy of a German instrument by J.T. Weigel. And I'll talk about him um, a little bit later. But this is actually an image of my exact oboe being made. So you can see here that he took the piece of wood and they actually cut out sections of the wood. And then that's allowed to allow for that curve when he glues it together. And then it again, it's wrapped in leather. So I have an excerpt for you of the oboe de kacha, and of course, this is Bach. <laughs> this is BWV number one, which I just love. Um, but the cantatas are not numbered in chronological order. So it's not actually the, his first cantata that he ever wrote, but I still like that BWV one has a solo for oboe de kacha. <laughs> so you'll notice here that we, we have the vocal like I mentioned with the English horn. And then I've got my bassoon style reed that I stick on here. So that's quite different from a modern instrument. So this is from BWV1. And this is a very happy cantata. As you can see from the text there, um, the actual title of the cantata um, talks about the morning star and how joyous it is. So this is a little excerpt of BWV number one. It's a really cool instrument. I just love it and I love playing it. Um, and this, what's funny about this cantata too is it's usually an English horn excerpt. So when you do English horn auditions, they'll usually ask for this cantata. So I'm going to talk about a couple of instruments that are pretty rare or don't really exist anymore. One of them is the Vox Humana. And this is a tenor oboe, again, in F, and it was used exclusively in England in church music where they would have double reed consorts and they preferred it over the, at the time, what would have been the tie. Um, you can see there, it's pretty much just a straight tube. <laughs> so it didn't last very long and it only lasted about 15 years from 1750 to 1800. And then we have some early bass oboes. So these are incredibly rare and the examples we have vary widely in pitch. And so we don't actually know when or where or why they were used. Um, because like I said, when they had oboe bands, they would title it as bass au bois, but it was actually meant to be played on the bassoon. So it's unknown what actually would have been played on a bass oboe. But there are a couple of examples that survive. There's a French baritone oboe here from about the middle of the 18th century. 
And then we have a straight bass oboe from 1883, and I wouldn't want to try to play that. <laughs> I can't imagine how far apart your fingers would have to be to play an octave lower than the modern oboe. So let's talk about my main instrument and my instrument with the Terre Haute Symphony Orchestra, the English horn. So um, the English horn was called a variety of things. It was the English horn, the corno inglés, the cor anglaise, and it was really used to describe a variety of different kinds of instruments, but they were all tenor oboes that were in the key of F. What we know today as the English horn was likely developed in 1720 right alongside the oboe da caccia by taking the oboe da caccia and adding a bold bell. And this was believed to be done by J.T. Weigel to have created the first instrument. So if you remember, my instrument is a copy of J.T. Weigel. So this instrument actually, as it exists, was called oboe da caccia. and English horn. So my instrument is actually a copy of not only an oboe da caccia, but the very first English horn. So by putting this bold bell on, we now have an English horn. <laughs> so I'm going to play, play it for you in a little bit, and I'm really, really excited about it. Um, it was first used by Christoph Gluck in his opera La Danza in 1755. It was usually composed for in pairs of instruments, and you can hear that in some Haydn symphonies, actually. He wrote um, for two English horns. And so around this time, like I said, it, it was created about the time of the oboe da caccia, and the, the German musicians really liked the oboe da caccia, but Italian composers said, hey, this English horn is really cool. So um, around this time in the late 18th century, we have the emergence of Italian opera, which became really popular style. So these are things like Rossini and Donizetti and all of those classics. And so it was shifting to more of that Italian, really lyrical style. And so the Italians loved the English horn <laughs> and they gave it these big, long, beautiful vocal lines. And so as the Italian opera spread, across Europe, then the English horn also spread too. So it's the English horn, but it, I haven't mentioned England. <laughs> so the English horn is not from England, and I really enjoy um, thinking about how the French horn is not French either. <laughs> um, so where does the name English come from? Well, in Middle High German, the word English meant angelic in addition to meaning an Englishman or um, the English language. So it is believed that the original title of the instrument was the horn of the angels. And that's not only due to the sound, but also due to its resemblance to the hunting horn, which is commonly seen played by angels in um, medieval church paintings. So it's believed that as German evolved and the word English no longer meant angelic, that it was then translated to English. And then the horn part likely stayed due to its evolution from the oboe da caccia and its relation to hunting horns. So I am so incredibly excited to play for you the first music for the English horn on the first English horn. So this is from Gluck's opera Orfeo e Eurydice. So that's um, Orpheus in the Underworld, if you're familiar with, with Greek mythology. And Gluck was a composer who, he was German, but he wrote in the French style and he wrote a lot of operas in the Italian style. So this is a solo from Orpheus and Eurydice.
So if you remember back to when I played the oboe da caccia, adding the bull bell really does change the sound quality and it gives it a much more mellow, much more focused sound. Um, it's not quite as dramatic on my instrument because my bell is wood, but on the metal instruments, it makes a really big difference. So let's keep going with the English horn. And I've got to, us oboists, we've got to switch our reeds and make sure all the reeds are soaked. <laughs> so I've got double duty here. Um, so as I mentioned, the English horn varied widely in shape and size around this time. So we've got straight instruments, we've got angled, we've got curved. Sometimes it's a flared bell, sometimes it's a bulb bell. So um, there was really a wide variety of experimentation going on at this time for the English horn, um, but we do know that the curved or the angled model was the most popular until the 20th century. And again, that's likely due to the ease of playing with um, fingerings. Um, the bassoon style reed was used at least until the 19th century. Um, Rebecca mentioned some things about the Paris Conservatoire and its influence on the oboe. And so we have um, an oboist there, Gustav Voigt, who decided that he really loved the English horn and he wanted to make it sound virtuosic. So he worked with an instrument maker to start adding keys to the instrument. Um, and then his playing actually inspired composers to write for the English horn, including Rossini and Berlioz. And then around 1860, we have um, the evolution to a completely straight instrument with added keys modeled on the uh, French conservatory system that's used on modern oboe. But the addition of the keys allows the player to have the fingers in a more natural playing position. And that was developed by Henri Broad and F. Fleuret. And this is the model that's still used today. And so my instrument is actually made by F. Fleuret. So here are some early English horns. So we've got one that looks a lot like mine from the early 18th the early 19th century, and so that's a curved instrument that would have been covered in leather with just a couple of keys. We have an example of the tree bear oboe that Voigt would have played, so it's again a curved model but with more keys. Then we have this really fun example of the angled instrument, um, which was also common at the time. It's really, it's really funny looking. I just love it. Um, and then we have here a buffet crampon oboe from 1867. And so that is this conservatory system that was created that's still in use today. So now it is excerpt time. So as I mentioned, um, the English horn really became popular through Italian opera and Italian composers really loved to write for the instrument and write these really big long lines. So we have here uh, the overture to William Tell, and you will know it immediately once I start playing it. <laughs> and it is actually the first large feature solo for the English horn. So it's really believed that this solo helped to establish its popularity. Uh, one funny thing about the English horn is a lot of the solos that it plays are really, really long. So I'm only going to play um, even part of this solo for you.
So I bet all of you are now ready to rise and shine, <laughs> as is commonly associated with that solo. So again, that's one of the first big solos for the English horn, and it's also one of those that's asked on every audition. <laughs> so moving right along to another solo that's asked on every audition, um, the English horn plays a lot of really famous melodies and a lot of um, symphonies that you really think of melodies, the English horn is used in. So this is from Dvorak's Symphony No. 9 for the New World. And this is from the second movement. And Dvorak wrote this melody um, inspired by African-American spirituals. And after his death, they actually put words to this English horn tune and created a spiritual that's now in the spiritual canon called Going Home. Um, and Dvorak really felt that African-American music was the foundation for American music. So you hear a lot of that in not only this symphony, but some of his other symphonies. And so I find it really interesting that he used the, the mellow and kind of sorrowful tone of the English horn to convey this. So again, probably a very recognizable melody to you for Dvorak. So I'm going to skip along here um, to an excerpt from Spanish music. So something that's really unique also about the English horn is it's used a lot in Spanish music. Um, so this is an excerpt from Manuel de Falla's El Sombrero de Tres Picos, and that means the three-cornered hat. It was a ballet commissioned by Sergei Diaghilev. And so what's really fun about this is I like to joke that the English horn is either the middle texture of the orchestra, like the viola, it's unheard, nobody really notices it, or everybody stops and it's just the English horn. And that happens in um, Symphony Fantastique, in Berlioz, it happens in Shostakovich, it happens in so many pieces, and it happens in this one. So the entire orchestra stops and it's just the English horn. solo from um, what I've been playing. So the English horn does have a wide range of colors and um, techniques that it does. So um, 
I wanted to play a little bit of modern music because I know that that's a common question that I, I saw in some of the videos. And so this is a piece that was written for me um, by a composer named Chapel Kingsland in 2010, and it was premiered in an art gallery alongside the photography of Jeffrey A. Wolin. And there's a picture there of one of his pieces. Um, and this is called Vietnamese Veterans for English Horn, and I'm just going to play a small excerpt of it. Um, and so it uses a few extended techniques. It uses vibrato very specifically where the composer indicated it. It also uses pitch glens and some glissando. Thank <laughs> So that was an excerpt of a 21st century piece um, with a few different techniques. You also got to hear the highest note that the English horn plays very loudly. <laughs> um, so that just gives you an idea of the range. So I wanted to end my presentation with what got me started on the English horn, and that's English horn in the movies. So. This is where you will most likely hear the English horn today, is movie, TV, video game soundtracks. Used a lot in Harry Potter, Schindler's List, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, those are the John Williams movies. Um, funnily enough, I've been re-watching a show called Smallville from the 2000s, which is about Superman, and every time he thinks about Lois Lane, there's an English horn solo. <laughs> so it's often, used for melancholy and love. And so I'm gonna play for you the solo that um, made me want to play the English horn. <laughs> is Princess Leia's theme from Star Wars. And that's all I have for my presentation. So I'm ready for questions. Thank you so much, Jenny. I just, I love being on these presentations with all my colleagues because I learned so much from you guys. And, you know, as a clarinetist, I don't know much about early oboe and, and all of that. So this has just been an absolute treat um, to have you join us today.
We have a rogue phone going off in our office. <laughs> All right, give us just a second to find it. <laughs> That's okay. This has been really fun and I've really enjoyed watching the videos of everybody else. I haven't had time to watch all of them. I'm really excited to watch Keith's that I know was just posted about all of his clarinets. Um, so I'm really excited that we could be able to do this for you. So we've got several questions in the chat here that um, we will work through with Jenny. If anyone thinks of questions, um, please add them to the chat and we'll make sure that um, she has time to answer them. Okay, I'm going to hide my participants here. Okay, so David Rose asks, um, what type of cloth coverings have been used to wrap the curved oboes or the curved uh, English horns? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So um, it is leather. Um, so I would imagine it would be different types of leather or different types of hides that would have been available. Um, mine is cowhide. I'm not sure if you can quite see it there, um, but you can kind of see where the seam is, where it's been wrapped. And I was curious, how does that change the sound? What, what was the purpose of wrapping those instruments? So the wrapping actually helps prevent leaking because it they did cut into the bore. And even though they glued it, the wrapping actually helps to seal the instrument and make sure that it's not leaking. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Because not very many instruments are wrapped in any sort of material. I mean, that's really kind of very unique to this particular instrument. It really is. And the any of the instruments that were curved were wrapped. So that means that up until the 20th century, so we're talking even the, um, the Rossini that I played and possibly the Dvorak could have been played on a leather wrapped instrument. Oh, okay. Um, okay, I th let's see. Sherry had a similar question. She was wondering about the delightfully colorful wraps. Um, yeah, we kind of talked about significance to them. Uh, or are they just for fun? <laughs> uh, were oh, you talking about reads, Sherry? Maybe she was talking about the, were you talking about the colorful reeds? I she love reed threads. So <laughs> one of the the really fun things about making reeds is the thread and you can, you know, really personalize it. And recently people have been hand dyeing their threads. And so um, I, there's a lady on Etsy who hand dyes them and, you know, maybe every couple of months she comes out with a new combination of colors and I buy it. <laughs> um, so yeah, but I usually use different colors at different times or for different things. So um, right now, a lot of what you saw were spring colors because I made them during spring. <laughs> um, and that tells me how old the reed is. And then also I'll use different colors if I'm trying say a different shape or a different, or a different technique, I'll wrap it in a different color. So that way I can identify the difference between them. That makes sense. I was about to ask if you use it to help kind of identify which reads because as a clarinetist, I make small marks on mine so that I know how old they are or what kind of shape they're in. So that, that'd be nice to be able to use colors. <laughs> yeah, I just saw um, a note from David that said, asked the material and the thread that I use is nylon and that's the most common, um, but some people do use silk. Oh, okay. Do you notice any difference between, depending on what material you use? I don't use silk because it breaks really easily and I tie my reeds pretty tight. And so I have a tendency to snap it. Snap right. It. But some people like, um, they don't like to tie their reeds as tightly onto the tubes. So it's just the difference in style. And we had another question um, from Dick. Uh, how many finger holes did the early oboes have? Um, and as the instrument transitioned to the England, English horn, did the holes stay the same? Um, he notes that your modern horn has a lot of keys. Are there more holes or more notes or just different ways that um, they cover the same holes? Yeah, so I'll actually show it on the Demore since it's a, a lighter wood, it's easier to see. Um, so you can see that we've got a hole for each of my fingers here. One, two, three. This is a split hole that allows me to play um, different half steps. And we've got a split hole here, two, three, and then we've got our two keys. 
And that system of three and three, and then using your pinkies down here, that continues through all of them. So that's um, what it's like on the oboe da caccia as well, which is a little bit harder to see, but it's got three holes and then three holes in the two keys. And then as we start to add keys, the finger holes remain the same, but once we get to the modern English horn, um, when you straighten out the instrument, like I said, the holes of where the notes actually come out would be really far spread apart for your hands. So if you see here, my fingers actually go here, here, and here, but you see that there's a lot of extra holes that are covered. And so that prevents me from having to hold the instrument like this. <laughs> so that's why they added these keys. So some of these, um, like this key doesn't actually even cover a hole with my finger. It actually pushes down a different hole there. That's a good question. It was nice to kind of see those instruments up close. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Sherry asks, how did it happen that a German instrument received an Italian name? <laughs> De <laughs> similar to De Caccia. <laughs> I have, you know, I do not know the answer to that. It, um, it's just been called the Ovo Dacaccia. And a lot of these terms at the time were used interchangeably. So you had musicians um, that were coming over all over from Europe. So like I said, Louis XIV had some of the greatest musicians in all of Europe. So he might have had an oboist who was originally from Italy and, you know, asked somebody to create this instrument and said, let's call it, you know, the name of my country. <laughs> um, so it, they're all called a wide variety of things around this time. Do you think it has anything to do with um, the uh, popularity of Italian opera? Because, you know, Mozart wrote, he's Austrian, but he and spoke German, but he wrote many operas in Italian because that was kind of the tradition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that could be another, it's just the Italian language um, really dominates music. I mean, allegro, uh, andante, those are all Italian terms. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Dick also asks, how many instruments do you own? How expensive are they, uh, ex especially the ones that have been specifically made for you or, or the remakes? Um, so in terms of oboe, I showed you all that I own except my modern oboe. Uh, I unfortunately do not own a modern oboe de more because it's so rarely played um, and it's it's really expensive. <laughs> um, so I don't have one of those. Um, Rebecca talked about the, um, I've got my oboe here. Um, oboes usually range in the professional model around um, seven to 9,000. English horns usually are a little bit more, about eight to 10,000. Um, what's interesting is the early instruments are actually much cheaper. <laughs> well, they don't have all the keys on them. Exactly. So it doesn't have all the key works and they're usually made of cheaper wood. So like I said, I do have a Grenadilla um, oboe, but this one is made of sycamore wood, which would have been used at the time too. But you know, that's a much cheaper wood to acquire. Um, so this instrument was about 3000 um, same for my oboe and then my dacacha was about, um, it was about 5000 because of what goes into making the, the curvature of the instrument. Sure. Sycamore would how appropriate for the Terre Haute Symphony Orchestra. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, Sherry asks, are there any oboe bands today? That would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, us oboists, we like our conferences, you know, when we have in-person activities. And so a lot of times oboes and bassoons will get together and play a lot of that old um, oboe band music. One of the most famous works that's played is the uh, fireworks, music for the Royal Fireworks by Handel. And that was written for, I think, 30 to 40 oboes. Oh my um, goodness, I had no and, idea. Yeah, and so that one is is one that a lot of people like to dig out when oboists are together. Um, I've actually played in an oboe band on early music instruments. Um, it's not too common now, just because a lot of the music is in the French style, 
And the French style, um, like you heard from my example, is very different from Bach and um, the Baroque music modern players are used to playing. So not a lot of modern players actually play a lot of the French music. And was that your dissertation correct? Was French music? Yeah. yeah, so my dissertation was trying to make French music more accessible to modern players. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, if anyone else has a question, feel free to unmute your mic, or if you just like to say hi to Jenny, you're welcome to do that. Yes, I would like to say hello to Dr. Kirby. Congratulations. Thank and you. I also wonder if Sammy, you'll love this question. Uh, is there an oboe equivalent of Mozart's clarinet concerto? Yes, and yes. so that's the Mozart oboe concerto. In fact, fun fact, well actually this is really the, the bassoon concerto, but if I play the beginning of the clarinet concerto on a B-flat clarinet with a bassoon on the Mozart bassoon concerto, it's a duet. So I wonder if maybe I could do that with the oboe concerto as well. <laughs> It's in C. Yeah, we'll, we'll, have, to, we'll have to play around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there is the Mozart Oboe Concerto. And then um, Mozart also wrote an oboe quartet that I actually really love. It's one of my favorite pieces. And it's for oboe, violin, viola, and cello. And the oboe concerto, if I'm not mistaken, is commonly asked for, like the exposition, probably like clarinet, is commonly asked for on auditions, correct? Every audition, yep. Every audition, yep. So <laughs> the oboe is certainly have a Mozart concerto. <laughs> Can you play a few lines from it? Yeah. Let me... Um... Switch out reeds and instruments and... <laughs> I know us oboes and all of our all of our gadgets. There are quite a few cartoon drawings of oboe nests in orchestra. <laughs> they, they have all sorts of things. All of their tools are out and they're soaking their reeds all the time. And they have to. I mean, that's they don't have a mouthpiece. Their their reed is of the utmost importance. Thank you. You're it's welcome. Mozart. <laughs> I know that one by heart. <laughs> yep, I get that. <laughs> All right. I, Go I ahead, Sherry. That's the reason why I ask. Yes. Well, thank you very much. It, that was spectacular. Dr. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Anyone else have a question or just want to say hi to Jenny? <laughs> Hi, Jenny. Thank you so much for doing this. It's wonderful. You did a great job. Thank you, David. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. If you have any other questions, feel free to forward them to Michelle or myself, and we'll make sure that Jenny gets them um, and that she can reply to you. Um, we will also post this recording on our YouTube page, so you're always welcome to watch it again. Um, and then I just wanted to give a quick plug for our upcoming presentations um, in May. On May 14th, I believe, I'm just going to double check the date because it's uh, a little bit different. So on May 14th, that's a Friday at 1 p.m., uh, we're going to have our second bassoonist, Sarah Freie, join us to talk about the bassoon a little bit. On May 25th, uh, we're going to have our principal flute, Dr. Joyce Wilson, uh, talk about the flute. Um, on June 8th, we're going to have our principal keyboardist or pianist, Tim Stevenson, and he's going to come and talk about the piano and its role in the symphony orchestra. And then also some of the other really cool keyboard instruments like the celesta. Um, so if you know the Sugar Plum Fairy, you are very familiar with the celesta. 
Um, and then at the end of June, on June 22nd, um, I'm going to do a preview of our upcoming season for the 21-22 season, our 96th season as the Terre Haute Symphony Orchestra. So uh, definitely be sure that you're there for that one so you can hear some excerpts from music coming up. Um, and we are super eager to get back to Tilson. We can't wait.